here we go. So um, we are going to finish up 11.1 and start 11.2 today. So in chapter 11, when we started off, we, we started with this concept of a function of two variables, saying that if instead of taking a number, plugging into a function, having a number come out, now we can plug in an ordered pair into a function and have a number come out, and that then we need three dimensions to visualize it, and that was a surface. And we were talking, looking at some some functions of two variables and we were looking at domains and what they look like visually. That's what we ended class with. And now we're going to say, hey, well, wait a minute. If you can have a function of two variables, why can't you have a function of three, right? So instead of plugging in an ordered pair and getting out a number, how about plugging in an ordered triple? So a point in three-dimensional space and getting a number out, right? Why not? Why not? Or what about a point in four-dimensional space and getting a number out? Is that right? I mean, why not? And it turns out, like, if, if any of you are, like, math majors, it turns out when we look at functions, you can have your standard function, which would be a function that we would say goes from R to R, number off the real number line, takes it to a number off uh, on the real number line. That's your standard function in college algebra, right? X squared. Take a number in, spit a number out. What we're just looking at right now, previous class, we said, well, why not go from R2 into R, right? Take, a, take an ordered pair, number off a plane, stick it, uh, uh, assign a number to it. Now you need three dimensions, right? But this right here says, well, why, not, why don't we pick a number, an ordered triple, and spit out a number, right? And you can imagine, you just keep going with this, R4 to R, R5 to, right? But you can go even, you can even go better than that. You could do something like this. How about taking in, I don't know, three numbers? And how about spitting out two? Why not? You want to see a function that does that? OK, I have to call it something. So why don't we call it uh, p equals, so it needs to spit out, well, sorry. P of x, y, z. So it's going to take in an x, a y, and a z, and it's got to spit out what? A point, a point in two-dimensional space. So maybe it's going to spit out, I don't know, x, y plus z, and then maybe 2x minus y plus z squared. That would be an example of a function that goes from three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space. So you would have to have five dimensions to visualize it which means it's not happening, right? You can't, you can't see it. Now, I'm going to go off a on a tangent here a little bit. I, I didn't realize I was going to do this, but I am now. And that's, you know in college algebra you study i, right? And you're taught that i is the square root of negative 1. And they, they may tell you a little bit in college algebra that when it comes to complex numbers, that all complex numbers can be written of the, in the form a plus bi. Have you all seen that before? If you, if you haven't or you don't remember, it's, it's not important. But this is, this is the way we can visualize all complex numbers. Examples of complex numbers are like 3 plus 2i. Another example of a complex number, negative 4 minus 5i. Another example of a complex number, negative 7i by itself. That's a complex number. Um, the number 5 by itself is also a complex number. So like the real number 5 is actually a complex number. It's just, it's 5 plus 0i. And see this one right here is actually 0 plus, or 0, yeah, plus negative 7i. Does that make sense? So if you want to visualize, if you want to visualize a complex number, we do it by, by drawing a plane and then saying this is going to be like the A part and this is going to be like the B part. So if I wanted to visualize that number, I would go to the right three, I go up two and I plot the point. And that point would be that number. And this right here is called the complex plane, double struck C. So it's, it's a, in order to talk about complex numbers, you have to have a plane to talk about them. Now, this one right here would be negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that would be the complex number negative 4, negative 5i. With me? Now, what about this? Where's that? 
it would be right there, right? Well, yes. So guess what? The x-axis is actually the real number line. Any point on this, this axis is the numbers you've been dealing with our whole lives. But if we kind of extend our vision out into two dimensions, we get the complex plane. So every real number we've ever dealt with is a complex number. Just kind of never looked at it that way. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because in college algebra, we introduce you to complex numbers, but we never do any functions with complex numbers. Like, you're not ever allowed to plug in anything with i into a function. We stay away from it. The reason why we stay away from it is because if I'm going to take a number from here, plug it into a function. So imagine I take a complex number. I take it through a function, and, I, and it spits out another complex number. Then how many dimensions will I need to visualize what's happening? Four. Four. Two for the input, two for the output. So this right here is the same as going from like R2 into R2. Two dimensions for the input, two dimensions for the output. And you can't see that. You can't visualize it, right? Which is why you take a class called complex variables after you've done all the linear algebra, differential equations stuff. You're at, a, you're at a point mathematically where you're mature enough to deal with functions that you can't see. Does that make sense? You start thinking about, okay, well, what does this function look like? Well, well I don't know, right? When I think you're, when you're you know, still in calculus, it's a little harder, especially in algebra. You sure as hell aren't going to be trying to visualize things in four-dimensional space. Make sense? So we stay away from it. We don't, we don't touch it. There was something else I wanted to say about these. I don't remember. OK, we're going to move on. There is such thing as infinite dimensional space, too, where you can have your input come from an infinite dimensional, you know, like imagine like x, y, z, but like a list that never ends of inputs going into a list that never comes out. So like R infinity is what we call it. R with the little infinity up there. But that's way beyond the scope of this class. We're, we're, we're way off now. Uh, nope. All right, so we have a function of three variables now. Not going to be able to visualize this because we need four dimensions. But we can still talk about the domain of a function of three variables. So in the last class, you remember when we were looking at like this problem and I asked you, you know, like what's the domain of that? We talked about this right at the end of class and when we graphed it, this is what we got. We were looking at the domain, but the domain is two dimensional because the domain came is the plane that got spit out to a number. So it was, it was flat, right? It was flat what we were looking at. So if we now have a function of three variables, there's a function of three variables. It takes in three things, x, y, z, and it spits out one number right there. And what we need when we talk about the domain of this is, I'm going to skip one, you know, plugging in one, two, zero. You should place x with one, y with two. Okay. Um, we would need for this to work, we would need what's underneath the radical to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because the square root's only defined for positive numbers. Or sorry, non-negative numbers. So we would need to somehow figure out what this looks like. And hopefully you recognize that. Uh, greater than or equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. You have an equation, uh, actually it's an inequality, but if, if it were an equal sign, what would this be? Not circle. You're, you're in three-dimensional space, so you'd be a sphere, right? I know you, was that what you said? I didn't hear sphere. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's a sphere. That would be a sphere of radius 9, right? But see, you want your sphere to have a radius of 9 or anything smaller. So this would, this would actually be a what? Not, not the outer shell of a sphere. It would be everything inside of it, too. So this would be a sphere and all the way down, so that would be a ball. So the domain of this would be a ball, a solid ball of radius 3. OK, that's what the domain of this would be, solid ball, radius 3. Does that make sense? 
Now that's just, that's just the domain, right? That's the stuff over here that you're allowed to plug in, right? So you can take any point inside or out on the surface of this ball and plug it into that function and the function's gonna spit out a number. Now that number is our fourth dimension so it's, we can't visualize it here. But there is something in the real world that you could use to kind of understand it. Let's say this is the domain. So I pick some point in here and I plug it into a function and it gives me a number as an output. Maybe that number is the temperature at that point on the ball. Right? So for every point on, all, on the ball or in the ball, there is a temperature at each point. And maybe that temperature is some function that we, that we have. Now in this case, it's, it's not, but does that make sense? You can have some sort of three-dimensional solid where at every point there's something defined. Could be temperature, could be humidity, uh, could be gravitational force, could be anything you want, really. But this starts to get us into things that are more like what the, we have in the real world, right? You have something that lives in three-dimensional space, and then at each point in that space, you have something that you're interested in knowing. Barometric pressure, wind speed, something, right? Does that kind of make sense? All right. Um, we can talk about the range of this function if we wanted to. What would be the biggest value we could get out of this? Look at that function up there. Three would be the biggest we can get. If all of these were zeros, and that means this would be zero, 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 which is definitely in our domain, right? And the biggest that thing would be is nine, the square root of nine is three, so that's the biggest it would be. How about the smallest it could be? Zero, right? If let's say you, you took z and y to be zero and you let x be three, then you're gonna get zero, right? So smallest you could get was zero, biggest is three. So the range of that, if if we could graph it somehow and visualize it, the outputs of this function are stuck between zero and three. Any questions? All right, that wraps up. 11.1. One. Now we're ready for 11.2. Oh yeah, continuity, limits. Now, let's, let's not be confused. Um, we've already talked about limits, haven't we, in this class? Um, but when we were doing them, we were doing limits of vector functions, weren't we? We were given a vector function, and then when we were said, if you take the limit, it was real nice, because all you do is take the limit of each component. Everything was nice, so long as we can maybe employ L'Hopital's rule or whatever it might need. But now we're talking about something different. We're talking about a function of several variables, maybe a function of two inputs, three inputs, and we're trying to figure out, does it have a limit? And this is going to be a huge problem. It's gonna be very difficult. And I'm going to try and illustrate why. So we're going to go back and we're going to first remember the definition of the limit back in Cal 1. This was the notation we used, right? We said the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l meant that when we look at the graph, as our x value approaches a from both sides, our function is approaching some value. And I have a picture here that shows, shows that happening. So here's, here's an example. This is actually the function sine of x over x. And if you look at sine x over x as a function, we all know you can't plug zero into this, right? If you plug zero in, it's undefined. But the limit does exist. The limit is one, and that's one of the ones that you learn kind of in the beginning of, of Cal 1. You're told like that limit goes the limit as x goes to zero of sine of x over x is one. In the beginning, they just tell you that. They say, believe it, don't worry about it, just believe it. And then later on, you can use L'Hopital's rule to prove it's true. You just do derivative of top and bottom separately and you can show that it goes to one. But the picture is the, picture is the most important thing here. As, as we approach zero, so what we're doing is we're trying to approach zero from both the left and the right hand side. We're on the function, marching our way towards an x coordinate of zero, and then we look at the y coordinate and we can see that as we move towards zero, the y-coordinate is approaching one from both sides. 
And then, you know, when we get to zero, well, it's undefined, right? But it's approaching one. That's pretty straightforward, right? Sometimes we would have that limits don't exist because if we're like in this one and we're approaching zero from the left and the right, we know that the, what's happening from the left side and the right side, they go to different places, don't they? So from here, it looks like it's going to one. For here, it looks like it's going to zero. So for the limit to exist, it had to be the same thing from both sides, right? Here, that doesn't happen. So we had a jump in the graph. So the important thing in two-dimensional two space is that the graph uh, um, and the limit had to exist, exist from both sides. So that was the main thing is that when we're looking at this, it had to go the same place from both sides. For a limit of a function of several variables, we are trying to determine what the function is approaching as we get closer to a point in two-dimensional space. So look at this notation first. We're saying we're not doing limit x approaches a anymore. We're doing limit as the point x, y approaches the point a, b. Because remember, our domain is two-dimensional, right? Two-dimensional. So we're not approaching a single value. We're approaching a point from a point. And then we're saying, well, what does that function of two variables do? Does it head to something? And I've got more, I've got more visualizations here. I think it'll, I hope it'll make sense. So the big question here is how many ways can we approach the point AB? So let's take a look at this surface. Okay, we have this surface here. Let me erase that sine x over x. Okay, I, I kind of showed you this in the last class. We have, we have a surface over here, right? It's a function of two variables, and the domain is on the ground, right? The domain is on the ground. Those numbers get plugged, or those um, ordered pairs get plugged in, and then we have the function's value. So this point right here corresponds to, if we're just looking at the ground, just at the domain, this is it. Now, I would like for us to approach the point zero, zero right now. So how many different ways can you approach zero, zero? infinitely many ways, <laughs> right? I mean, I could, I could go like this. Would you agree that this point x, y is approaching zero, zero? Yes. yes, and then I eventually get there, right? Now, what if I start down here? Could I just come in like this? That would be approaching zero, zero. Maybe I, I would wanna come in just the x-axis, just straight in the x-axis, that's approaching zero, zero. I could spiral in, right? I could, I could I could do like a, like a drain, like circling a drain down to nothing, right? And there's, there are an infinite number of paths that could get you to zero, zero. And in, back in Cal 1, it was easy because when we approached an x value, we could only come in from two directions, right? Left and right sides. That's it. This is going to be very problematic because for the limit to exist, it has to exist from every possible path. And that's impossible to check, isn't it? Isn't that impossible to check? Or, or it's going to be a long semester, right? <clears throat> so there's an infinite number of paths that lead to the point AB. For the limit to exist at the point AB, the limit must exist and be the same for every path leading to AB. Not good. So let's take a look at this, this one here. So we're trying to take the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0. So we're trying to head towards the origin. And we want to know what this function right here does. Now, keep in mind, this right here is our f of x, y. It's a function of two variables, right? And I'd like to know what's happening to it. Well, just like we did in Cal 1, the first thing you'd always do is just plug right in and see what happens, right? Replace the x with zero and the y with zero. What happens when you replace x and y with zero? Yeah, so if you just try direct substitution, zero, zero, you get zero over zero, which is undefined. And that doesn't tell you anything. 
right? So now we need to see, is there a way we can approach zero, zero? And, and this means we need to pick a path and see about heading towards zero. So the way I'm going to do this is there's an infinite number of paths, right? So how about we go in and we try and go and approach along, along the x-axis. So what I'm saying is I'm going to go and I'm going to try and approach this coming along, in, along the x-axis like this. So I'm going I'm to start moving my point in, right? It's going to come in this side or this side. It won't matter. But I'm going to stay on the x-axis, right? If I'm on the x-axis, then y has to be 0 for that to happen, right? If I'm sliding points in along the x-axis, y is 0. Yes? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to say, OK, I'm coming in along the x-axis, so let y be 0. And then I'm going to do the limit. Limit as, watch how I write this, as x 0 approaches 0, 0. So notice I've replaced the y with 0. So 0 is 0. I mean, y is 0. And then I'm going to say x squared minus 0 squared over x squared plus 0 squared. And what would we get here if we do that? We just get 1, right? We get 1. Algebraically, this is just limit as x0 approaches 0, 0. And then x squared over x squared is 1. So we just get 1. And the limit of a constant is just the constant. So we get 1. So that means as we approach, as we approach 0, 0, along the x-axis, my function's value is approaching 1. Visually, here's what we've got. I've, I went ahead and graphed the surface for us. Okay, so here's the surface. I'm going to kill the lights here in the middle just so we can see this. There's our surface. It's really a pretty cool looking, like fortune cookie looking surface, isn't it? Kind of a weird thing going on. We know it's zero, zero, it's undefined. And if you look from the top, well, can't really see, but some crazy shit going on at zero, zero, right? So if we come in along the x-axis, I've kind of made it transparent so we can, we can see through this, this function, all right? Do you see the x-axis in green? If I start approaching 0, 0, I need to make it a little bit more transparent. There we go. OK, can you see the, the x-axis? This is my, my point approaching 0, 0 along the x-axis. And then the black dot is the function's value there. So it's like this point's being plugged into the surface. And look where it is. It's up here at 1, isn't it? And as I come in, I move in and check it out. It just stays up there at 1. Now what happens when I get to 0? Oh, computer freaked out. Do you see it freak out? Can't do that computation. But as soon as I go past it, it's still up at 1. So it's, it's kind of cool because it's, it's like if you're going to walk along the x-axis, you would just be walking along like this little edge and just be not going up or down, right? But there would be like this, ab this abyss at zero, right? This weird like singularity that goes into the next dimension or something, right? You with me? OK. Now, have we shown that the limit, have we shown that the limit of this function as you approach 0, 0 is 1? Yes. Well, from the x We've only shown from the x-axis that it is. We have to show that it's 1 from every path. And I already said that's impossible, right? So what's easier is not, it's, it's going to be easier for us to show that a limit doesn't exist than it is going to be for us to show it does. Because to show it doesn't exist means we just have to find two paths that have different limits. So right now, remember, along the x-axis, it's 1. Now let's come along in the y, on the y-axis. Okay, and let's see what happens if we come in along the y-axis. So let's do the algebra part first. So we're coming in along the y-axis. That means x has to be 0. So this becomes let x be 0. 
and this becomes limit, and now we're going to go 0y approaches 0, 0. And now replace all your x's with zeros. And then what is that? That's going to be negative 1, right? Because the zeros are gone, and then algebraically, negative y squared over y squared is negative 1. Limit of a constant a constant, so we get negative 1. That means, remember, if I, walk, if I was walking along that function towards 0, 0 along the x-axis, I was up at 1, right? But if I try and come in along the y-axis, I'm like down below at negative 1. And you can see it from the picture. So here's, here's my surface. Notice the y-axis in green. Make this transparent. And can you see below it, you have the black dot down there? That's where you are on the surface as you walk along the y-axis. So I'm walking along, and notice the function's value is just, just constant, right? It's just negative 1 the whole time. It's walking along. I'm negative 1. Now when I get to 0, it's going uh, to freak out there, but it's OK. Past that, still down at negative 1. So this would be equivalent to like in Cal 1, if the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are different, then the limit doesn't exist. If we can find two paths where the limits aren't the same, the limit doesn't exist. And that's what we can conclude now. So in conclusion for this one, we have that this limit, as x, y approaches 0, 0, does not exist, exist since we got uh, different results along different paths. Questions? Yes? So we can prove it doesn't exist, right? You can prove it's, it doesn't exist so long as you can come up with two paths that give you different answers. Yeah. How do we prove that it does exist? To show a limit of a function of two variables does exist, you can do it using the squeeze theorem. A squeeze theorem will work, and I'm, I'll get to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one where we can show it. All right? But it's usually harder to do. All right, let's take a look at a new one. Let's see, this one right here. So let's investigate this limit as xy approaches 0, 0 of x times y over x squared plus x, uh, y squared. Now, I'm going to be approaching 0, 0 in every single example I do in here today. But that doesn't mean that you can always have functions that are going to 0, 0. It's just almost every, I think every problem in the textbook, they're going to go to 0, 0. But it could be going to like 2, 2. And maybe there's problems at 2, 2. All right, let's just, let's just double check. Do we have a problem if we just do direct substitution in there? We get 0 on top and on the bottom, so it's undefined. OK, so let's pick a path. Why don't we stick with what just worked, right? Let's try the x-axis and the y-axis and see if we get different answers. So how about the x-axis? Let's come in along the x-axis first. To do that, I'm going to let what? y equals 0. And then I'm going to rewrite the limit. So I'm going to go limit. I'm going to say x0 approaches 0, 0. And then what do I get on top? Zero. zero, and on the bottom I get x squared. But zero over x squared is zero. There's just no way around it. So that limits zero. So that means on this particular surface, as I'm walking along the x-axis, I'm just always zero, right? As I'm approaching zero, zero. All right. Well, let's hope for something better when we come, on, uh, come in along the y-axis, right? So what about along the y-axis? You see what's happening already? We're going to let x be 0. And so what do you get? Limit 0y approaches 0, 0. But that again just becomes 0 over this time y squared, but that's still 0. So you're getting the same answer which means tho both those paths are giving you the same result. So it's looking like maybe the limit is 0. But you've got to check every, every path. We don't have time for that. So 
we're just going to try and hope for a different path. So let's try a different path. How about this path? How about the path y equals x? So th think about what this path looks like. Here's our, here's our plane, right? We did the x-axis coming in like this, right? We did the y-axis coming in like this. y equals x would be us approaching 0, 0 along the diagonal, which seems like the next like, candidate for a path, right? Does that not seem reasonable? OK. So let's try that. So what would happen if we, we replace y with x? Now, you can also replace x with y, but I'm going to replace y with x. So I'm going along y equals x. So this limit becomes, I'm replacing y with x becomes xx goes to 0, 0. And then on the top, instead of x times y, what do I have? x squared. And then on the bottom, I have x squared plus x squared, which is 2x squared, and voila, look at that. Algebraically, that simplifies to be 1 half, doesn't it? Yeah. And that means the limit's 1 half. Remember, you don't, let x, you don't let the x's go to 0 until after you've done the algebraic simplification. So we simplify first, we get 1 half, and then we take the limit, and it doesn't matter anymore. So we get 1 half. And we're done, because we found a, a path that didn't match. Yes? What if it were possible to say, think of it as a circle shrinking on that point? Is there some way to measure like the, how flat that circle is? And like, if that circle flattens out, it approaches. Wait, wait. It, say that again. I'm not understanding. What if, would it be possible to say, think of, instead of approaching along lines, to think of, say, a circle around that point that shrinks, basically? So you define both x and y. I'm uh, probably getting way beyond calculus here, but would it be possible to say measure the concavity of a circle, the concavity, the uh, flatness of a circle as it were to shrink? So you're just saying instead of having like paths going in, have like some sort of circle that's shrinking? Yes. Um, no, I think it, it is beyond this course, but that's exactly. So with limits, when you first learn limits in Cal 1, you're introduced, you're given the definition, and sometimes professors will teach you the epsilon delta definition. Did anyone see the epsilon delta definition of the limit? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the, like, the it says uh, for X. every epsilon greater than 0, there exists. Ah, a delta greater than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, that implies that the absolute value of f of x minus l equal, is less than epsilon. That's the strict limit definition of, I'm sorry, that is the strict delta epsilon definition of the limit. When you say the limit, if you say limit x approaches a of f of x, equals L, back in Cal 1. What you mean is this. That's the rigorous mathematical definition. A lot of times in Cal 1, we don't show that because students don't even really understand the logical structure of a statement like this. Right? So anyone see that? OK. So actually, what you're asking me has more to do with the way we would prove this rigorously. And we use these things called epsilon balls. And that's kind of exactly what you're talking about. You make a little epsilon ball here, and then what you do is you shrink the ball down, and that's how you can prove. But that's, that's more of a rigorous proof. Okay. So it's, not, it's, it's beyond the scope of this class, but it is definitely, it's actually more, it's deeper in than, than we get. Yeah, okay. So. Is that how GPS works? GPS? Yeah, on the same principle. Uh, I don't know. I'm not seeing the... GPS, like triangulation, like finding where you are GPS, yeah. they just triangulate three, you know, three satellites measure time takes for signal to travel. I know that. Huh? What's that? Oh, I said I did not know that. Yeah, it's just satellites in space and they just, three satellites and you can find your unique position on a surface. Okay, so let, let's get back to this. Great question, great comment. Yes, there is a way to do it, um, but it is... Again, a little bit more than what we're going to do here. So we're done. This limit does not exist. Should we take a look at it visually? 
just to see. That's what it looks like. So what I think is cool about this surface is that if we come in along the x-axis, right? So I'm on the x-axis right now. Notice that the value was zero, right? It's just the black dots exactly where the green line is. So it just stayed zero. So as I walk in along the x-axis, I don't move. It's kind of cool. And then if I come in along the y-axis, I forgot that there's a top view so you can see us going, man, this is way too big. You see us coming in along the y-axis that's here. You'll notice that, again, it doesn't move. It just stays flat. But it's when we come along the diagonal. So now when we come in along the diagonal, let's take the surface out. You can see we're up there at, we're up there at one half the whole time. Make sense? So limit doesn't exist. <coughs> That's just me saying, yeah, since it's hard to show from every path, we are going to focus on trying to show limits don't exist. This one looks fun. All right, let me leave these up here because we're going to come in along those paths again because it seems to be like that seem, that's working for us. So let's try this. Um, if y is 0, if y is 0, what do we get? So this limit, right? On top we get 0. zero. zero on the bottom we get x squared. x squared, and then that's 0. So OK, we've got, we've got our first result. Now what if we come in along the y-axis, let x be 0? On top we get zero, on the bottom we get y to the fourth, and that's zero again, right? So there's no, no, nothing good here, nothing good. So what would be our next candidate? Y equals x, right? Let's try that. Let's go y equals x. So I'm going to have limit, I'm going to replace all my y's with x's. And so what do I get on top? <clears throat> All my y's have become x's. X cubed, x cubed over? X squared plus x to the fourth, right? OK, can we clean that up at all? Before I take a limit algebraically, what can I do? Every single term has an x squared, right? So you can factor out x squared, cancel. So I'd still be left with what on top? X and on the bottom? 1 plus x squared. And now let's let x go to 0. I mean, we don't have any way around it now. If we let x go to 0, what do we get? 0 over 1, which is? 0, which still, <laughs> still matches. So that path didn't work. So we get to use another path now, right? Let x be, well, 1, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. If x is 1, you're not going to head to 0, 0. Right? You know what I'm saying? If you let x be 1, then you're going to be coming in along that line, and that doesn't head towards 0, 0. So you just have to pick a path that goes to 0, 0. X equals y? Well, that's what we just did. Oh, no, I meant like, like, well, that's like, like, have two y's instead of, x equals y like, squared. you could do x equals y squared or y equals x squared. You come in, you come in along a parabola if you wanted to. What about negative y equals x? You could go negative y equals x. I'd, right, there's like all these things we could do, right? So, so watch, watch this. I'm going to try and kill off about an infinite number of them at one time. So watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and come in along this line. Check it out. I want to come in along the line y equals mx. And I'm not going to fix m. I'm going to let m be a variable. And what this is allowing me to do is take a look at what this limit becomes if I come in there with, a gen with an arbitrary line of slope m. Now, we just did y equals x, which meant we did y equals 1x, right? 
But if I plug that in, that's going to cover all possible slopes. Does that make sense? And let's just go with it and see what happens. I'm going to do the limit. I'm going to go x, mx. See, I'm replacing y with mx. Approaches 0, 0. And now rewrite this. What does that become if I replace y with mx? x times mx squared over x squared plus mx to the fourth. Agree? So far, every limit that we've done has given us what? Answer. Zero. zero. Hasn't it? Maybe we can get this to be something other than zero. Let's try. What, what do we have control over? What, what do we actually get to control here? M, right? M is up to us. The thing is, I didn't want to start with like, you know, let's go 1x and then let's do 2x and 3x and 4x and keep on doing this. Instead, I'm just leaving it as a variable. We're going to look at the end and we're going to say, now if I start changing m, how does it affect this limit? All right, so let's clean this top up. We've got uh, m squared x cubed on top. On the bottom, we've got x squared <coughs> plus m to the fourth x to the fourth, right? We have a common factor again that we can pull out for x. Right, so x, x, xm is going to go to 0, 0. And on the top, we have m squared x over 1 plus m to the fourth x squared. All right, so I've just basically reduced everything by a factor of x squared. What happens as x goes to 0 on the top and the bottom? Zero over one. We get 0 over 1, right? No matter what we choose for m. Right? No matter what we choose for m. There's no way to get around it. Do you all see that? There's absolutely, no matter what I choose for m, as long as it's a real number, if I let x go to 0, and xm, right, if x goes to 0, which it is here, then that's going to go to 0, that's going to go to 0, and I'm going to be left with 1, and there's no way around it. This didn't help. All this does is shows me that this is true for all m. But haven't I tried an infinite number of paths now? but there's still infinitely many more, right? I've done the infinite number of lines going in. I haven't done parabolas going in. I haven't done spirals going in. But boy, that is one clever way to attack an infinite number of possibilities. Let me see if I have a visual here. So along the x-axis, y-axis. Okay, so here's along the, the line. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take all this out of here. Yes? So earlier when we were talking about um, other things we could substitute, mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry if you had already answered this before, but why couldn't you do like, um, okay, so I know we did uh, y equals x, and I, and I said x equals y, which is essentially the same thing, but uh -huh. replacing all of them, would you still get the same thing? You would get the same thing. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, because they're the, same, they're the same line. You're coming in on the same line, so you're going to get the same result. X equals Y is the same as Y equals X. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is pretty cool. Let's look at this from the top. And let's take the uh, surface completely out of here and just talk about my, let's talk about the line we're coming in on. So we're coming in along this line, right? That's Y equals X. But we've looked at all possibilities. We have basically spun this line around using all different possible values. Now, I didn't have to consider a vertical line. Why do I not need to worry about a vertical line? Because we already tested that out. We tested the y-axis, didn't we? 
So we don't need that. And then horizontal line, that's pretty easy too. We test it. But we took care of all the infinite number of possibilities in here, didn't we? Linear approaches. And we, we see, if we look at the surface, we'll kind of see what's happening here. It's really cool because this is the line we're approaching on. And remember, the black is the curve. It's like if you were, if you were walking along the surface following that green path on the ground, the black, is the, the black part is your path. I don't know, I, I like to look at it. it's, well, why is that so slow, you see that? So it's like out here, you can see that right now, I, I'm, I'm getting closer to zero, zero, and then what happens is I start diving down, and the limit is going to approach. See how it's approaching? Now, at zero, it's gonna, the computer's gonna probably freak out. It's not freaking out though. But no matter how I spin this line around, I'm always going to have that same thing happening on the surface. So there's no, there's no, uh, there appears to be no line that's going to give it to me. Do you all see that? But there's something interesting happening there. Do you all see this little weird thing happening here? Do y'all see that? Yeah, do you see that if, if you were walking along the top edge of this, doesn't it look like you would kind of wrap around and come back like that? But you would never be down here at zero, would you? So it looks like if I walk across, it looks like my, my domain point would be approaching zero, zero, but it looks like my function's value is up here somewhere. And that path around, if you look at it from the top, that path around, Looks parabolic, doesn't it? it? Looks parabolic. So maybe we need we need to approach from as you know using a parabola instead. Now this is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. So what is this parabola right here? X equals, <clears throat> x equals y squared. Now without the picture, this would be tough. Okay, but we have it. So let's try that. So this is our first, this is our first attempt, whoa, did I just delete all that? What the heck? I think I just deleted that. I don't know what I did. Oh, you know what, I, that's what I did. So we're going to come in along another path. We're going to come in along the path x equals y squared, that, that sideways parabola. And uh, I need to look at the function because I forgot the limit. There it is. So we're doing this. So we're replacing x with y squared. So this is going to be the limit as y squared y approaches 0, 0. And now replace that x with y squared, right? So the top becomes y squared, y squared, so y to the fourth. And then over, replace that x squared with y squared, so that becomes y to the fourth. And then plus that y to the fourth doesn't change. And look at that, you have all y to the fourths. And so you have one on top and you have two on bottom, and you combine them and then reduce out, and you get what? One half. So this limit's one half. So the limit doesn't exist. So you're just going to have to play with that. Now, in retrospect, right, going back and looking at this limit again, and kind of analyzing this again, you might say to yourself, look, I've failed several times trying different paths. And the problem has always been that in the numerator, I keep getting zero, and in the denominator, I keep getting one. So maybe there's a way to make all these powers be the same at the end, so that I can get a nice factoring and canceling. So maybe I can shoot for making them all fourth powers. So how can I make this a fourth power? I can either make this y cubed or that x squared become a y squared, right? If that's y squared, y squared, then I get a y to the fourth. That's ready y to the fourth, and if I do, again, y squared squared, you're going to get... Do you see now, looking back at it, you might have a different sort of approach now of how to get, 
how to get this? No? All right, we move on. So that's that path. That's just, I've always just thought that's so cool. Look at that. Well, it doesn't exist at zero, zero. If I spin this around, at zero, zero, I've got a major problem. But as you approach zero, zero along this path, it's up there at one half. I don't know oh, if that's what you're I asking. Gap. Yeah, there's a gap in here. Like, no, but on like the actual, like, correct, like. What gap? What are you talking about? Like that line on the Z axis. Here? Yeah. Yeah, there's a gap there because at zero, zero, this function's undefined. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So the limit doesn't exist, we're happy. Now, squeeze theorem. This theorem can help us find some limits without needing to test paths. So this theorem, back from Cal 1, said, I don't know if you remember this from Cal 1, the squeeze theorem, but it basically said that if you're, <coughs> if you're trying to find the limit of something, back in Cal 1, then if you could somehow take the function and put it between two other functions with an inequality. So let's say you're trying to figure out what happens to some function as you take a limit. You're like, what happens if I take the limit of this as it goes to zero? And maybe you're getting zero over zero. So what you do is you, you squeeze this function between two other functions and then if you know where that goes, okay, so you, if you know what this limit goes to and you know what this limit goes to, then if these two answers are the same, then that one has to go to the same thing. And that was the squeeze theorem. This is the same exact theorem, but with functions of, of two variables instead of one. So let's say we're interested in knowing what happens to f of x, y. Well, if you can squeeze it between two other functions of x, y, and these two limits go to the same place, then that limit in the middle's got to go to the same place too. All right? Can I just state that? Is it, does that pretty much make sense to you all? Yeah. Now here's one that we can do with it. <clears throat> this limit, this limit does exist. So that means did y'all hear me? This limit does exist. And that means if you were to sit here and start trying paths, you would spend your entire life checking paths and they would all give you the same answer. And you would never be able to find that one that doesn't work because it doesn't exist. But the way we prove it is using the squeeze theorem. That's the only way we can ever show a limit like this exists. All right, so this is our f of x. Why? This is our function. And what I need you to do is give me two functions I can squeeze it into and be real careful because the, the functions I need to squeeze it in between, they have to go somewhere and you better know where they go. All right? <clears throat> so let me put this down and let's see if we can't squeeze this in. And what is my limit going to be going to? Zero, zero, right? I'm going to be letting x, y, both x and y go to zero, zero. So what I'm looking for you to find right now are the two things that you want to squeeze this in between. You basically need like a lower bound and an upper bound for this function. To say sine squared y. Sine x over x would be less than this? Is, is that what you're saying? Or? Like, can we, can we jump to something like that? Or is it too different to be able to say like. Because that's just one that we know that has. That has a limit. Is that what you're saying? Like, yeah, you know, sine x over x, that's going to go to 1. Yeah. Um, 
you could, you could use that one so long as you can slap it here or here and, and be sure that it's true. Like, is sine x over x always bigger than that? Yeah. Like, is it? Is sine x over x always bigger than that? Or less than that, sorry, less than that? So whatever we put here and here, you better be able to justify that it's true, right? And you're going to have to know the limit for them either, also. But she was using sine x over x because we know that limit is 1. No, I'm saying the limit of the middle one before it, like... We no, no, we don't know the limit of this one. Yeah. We, are, we, are get, we are banking on this one and this one. We will know, and they'll both go to the same number, and then the middle one goes there, too. Oh. That's squeezing it, right? That's the whole idea of the squeeze theorem. Oh, okay. All right, so I help. Yes, I help. <laughs> Let's just start with that. Does that seem like a decent candidate? I mean, just, so you gotta start somewhere, right? Would we agree that that's true? X squared, it's positive, right? Worst it could be a zero. Sine squared, positive. Worst it could be a zero. Bottom, positive, positive, adding up, positive. Like, there's no way this can ever be negative. Agreed? So this has gotta be either greater than or equal to zero. That is a true statement. And if I take the limit of this right now, limit, as x, y goes to 0, 0, well, it's a constant, right? So that's going to 0, right? Yes? So what I'm doing here is I'm actually hoping right now that this limit actually does go to 0, because I'm going to need it to if this is going to work. But now I need an upper bound. I need something here that we also know goes to 0. But you have to be sure that it's always bigger than that. Got any ideas? Go ahead. So it has to be bigger than the middle one. Has to be bigger than the middle one. We better, and we have to be able to show it. Do like ln x. Couldn't we do like something simple like x plus one or something like that? X plus one? Yeah, on the denominator, can we do something simple just like x plus y? X plus y instead of two y squared? Yeah. But leave this the same? Is that what you're saying? We could change that too. So if you made this x squared plus, you said y? Yeah. Let's say we leave this alone, OK? And we make it x squared plus y, then our new denominator would be smaller yeah. all the time? What if y is really small? Then it's going to be smaller than 1. You're on the right track. You have to play a game here. Who else had? No, someone else? X Wait, have, say it again. Have the what? Have x be square root of 2y. So when we square it, we get 2y squared on top of 2y squared. So you're still trying a path. You, I think you're trying a path, aren't you? Like you're trying to replace a path? Like replace x with something so that, so that would be trying to come in on some sort of path. But we already are, we've thrown that out the window. Because every path is going to give us the same answer. Yes. Uh, 1 over x? But just like the positive side of 1 over x. OK. So are you sure that, that, that this is always smaller than 1 over x? For every value of x and y ever? If it approaches 0, like. No, I know 1 over x go, that, that right there will not go to 0, though, because x is approaching 0. Yeah. But right? If I do like 1 over x here, if x goes to 0, that thing goes to infinity. Oh. And so we're saying it's between infinity and zero. That, but I'm still not even cons uh, sure that this is always smaller than that. What if we just take out the sine squared y? What do you mean? Sine squared y is always going to be uh, less than 1, right? So it's yes. Gonna, so are you saying you use sine squared y? Yes. Like x squared over x squared plus 2y squared. OK, so take that out. Yeah. I agree we could use that. But because does everyone agree that what I'm covering up here, sine squared y, is between negative 1 and 1? But then you square it, so it's always between 0 and 1? Yeah. So this number in here is just making this piece either smaller or itself. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. So then we could just put this piece here. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And if we did that, I would agree we could do that. But I'm not sure we could, we could know what this goes to. Like, take the sine squared out. Can you, can you tell me where that goes? 